Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Orchid History. Today we will be looking at the Roman Empire in the first century of the Common Era. Like so many before them, the people of the Roman Empire noticed orchids and included them in their medicine, art and even mythology. Recently we discovered the love of orchids might have started in the Roman Empire, long before it was initially thought. What are believed to be representations of orchids is present in the Ara Passis Augustae, that once stood inside the temple of Venus Genetrix. The Ara Passis celebrates the period of peace attributed to Emperor Augustus, and its exterior walls are full of representations of the Roman prosperity of fauna and flora, from rich plantations to exotic wild plants. While it's impossible to confirm that these are orchids, a team of researchers believe so, and the similarities are certainly there. This is not only the first time we see Romans represent orchids, but also shows that they were considered relevant enough to deserve to be immortalized in the panels of the temple. Eventually, the Roman Empire spread out, annexing its neighboring countries. When it reached Greece, the local culture and mythology stayed strong, spreading throughout the whole empire. One of such myths shows us for how long orchids have been associated with sexuality, gender identity, and even androgyny. It's the story of Orcus, which is unfortunately too hot for YouTube. But in broad strokes, Orcus was the son of a nymph and a satyr. And well, you should Google it for yourselves. This story has everything. Orgies, violence, the fates, and botany. At this point, orchids had such a presence in the empire that they were described by my favorite Roman, Gaius Plinius Secundus, or Pliny the Elder, a man that thought us so much about the culture and everyday life of so many people, it's impossible to overstate how important he was to history. In his work Naturalis Historia, published in 77 CE, he named and described several plants of the Ophris genera. Ophris was the Greek word for eyebrow, and according to Pliny, these plants were used to darken eyebrows. This may also come from the doctrine of signatures, a common theory at the time, that stated that things that resemble a body part can affect said body part. For example, orchid tubers look like testicles, therefore they have an effect on virility. And Ophris marginal labellar hairs resemble eyebrows, therefore they can be used to darken or strengthen them. The Sinus orchis, by some called orchis. If males eat the upper parts, they will be parents of male issue, they say. And females, if they eat the lower part, a female. In Thessaly, the men take the soft portion in goat's milk as an aphrodisiac, in the hard part as an anti-aphrodisiac. At approximately the same time that Pliny was working on his books about natural history, on what today is a part of Turkey, Pedanios Discaridis was working on his most famous work, the Materia Medica, published in Greek and written between 70 and 90 CE. This would become the precursor to all modern Western pharmacopoeias, translated into Latin, Arabic, and with supplements and commentary from Arab and Indian scholars. It never left circulation and was copied and illustrated many times for more than 2,000 years. Some of Discarides manuscripts still survive in the archives of the monasteries of Mount Athos. And in several archives around the world exist richly illustrated copies that are several hundreds of years old, such was the importance of his work. Here's what Discarides told us about what we suspect to be Orchis Militaris. Orchis has leaves scattered on the earth around the stalk. In the bottom of it, it's similar to an olive. It is said that if the bigger root is eaten by men, it makes their offspring males, and the lesser eaten by women makes them conceive females. The tender root is given to encourage venereal diseases, and the dry root to suppress and dissolve venereal diseases. It grows in stony, sandy places. And about Anacamptis morio? Testiculus alta. The root applied is able to dissipate edema, clean ulcer, and repress herpes. 
Smeared on, it destroys fistulas and soothes inflamed parts. Sprinkled on dry, it stops neomai, and a decoction cures the intestines. And on the Plantera bifolia. Satyrium, the root sweet to the taste and pleasant in the mouth. One author drink it in black hard wine for severe spasms and use it if he wishes to lay with a woman, for they say that this is also an aphrodisiac. It is surprising to see the amount of orchids observed by the Scarides, and it is likely he saw many more that he didn't describe, either because they were thought to be the same plant or because they didn't have a medical use. Pliny and Yoshkarich both lived in the same empire. Both were avid writers and seekers of knowledge, but they never met, and as far as we know, they never even read each other's writings. In natural history, Plinius mentions other authors, including Theophrastus, but Pedanius Dioscorides is never mentioned. They are also from very different parts of the world. Pliny was from the north of Italy, and Pedanius from southern Anatolia. And yet they both wrote similar things about orchids, both in medicinal use and description. This proves how widespread orchids and knowledge about them was. It is believed that orchids took an even bigger role, both in religious and everyday life of the people in the Roman Empire. After all, only relevant plants get their own mythos and to be used as decorations in temples. However, like everything that had sexual and gender connotations, some of the records have been destroyed by the Catholic Church as it gained importance. That was it for the Roman Empire, and for our next video we will probably be moving back east, since as far as written records go, there isn't much to note about orchids until the 12th century. We hope you enjoyed this video, and please let us know if you would like us to continue with the series. And also, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Goodbye.